Hello, friends. We are excited that our No Small Endeavor Plus community is growing. Now, all of our friends in the No Small Endeavor orbit are intelligent, smarter than average, winsome, good-looking, while the members of NSC Plus seem especially so because they are enjoying ad-free episodes as well as special subscriber-only content once a month where we discuss habits and practices learned from our guests over the years. And those special episodes have been a lot of fun, personal and practical. I love sitting down with our producer, Jacob Lewis, and recording those for you. And so we would love to have you join us. And your NSC Plus membership helps support the show. So because of all of these things, we'd love for you to join the NSC Plus family. Just go to nosmallendeavor.com, click subscribe, and start catching up on our subscriber-only episodes today. Again, go now, nosmallendeavor.com, click subscribe, and start catching up. See you there. Hey, I'm Jacob Lewis, executive producer of No Small Endeavor, exploring what it means to live a good life. Today, we are bringing you the unabridged interview that Lee did with John Deere. It was just too good, and there are things that you're going to learn and hear in this unabridged version, like how Fred Rogers changed John Deere's life, uh, how uh, peace activist Daniel Berrigan got a lifetime ice cream deal from Ben & Jerry's, and Thich Nhat Hanh's personal confession to Father John Deere. Buckle up, enjoy. This is a great interview. You can reach out to Lee directly at lee at nosmallendeavor.com. All right, here we go. Father John Deere, it's a delight to be here with you in your home in the hills above Morro Bay, California. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Lee. It's a delight to be here. I've, you uh, you brought me in here a few minutes ago, and it was like a it's like a living testimony to the American peace movement, with all of the pictures and. Uh, I hope it's the Christian peace. The movement. Christian peace movement. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's a better way to put, to put it, given what you're up to. <laughs> Indeed. So. Um, but, yeah, I've had an incredible journey and met the most wonderful people yeah. on the planet, and that's why I always tell young people. Get involved in working to end war and injustice because they're perks. Yes. Which is my fancy word for blessings, <laughs> which is you get to meet the saints. Yeah. And I don't know why. Forget hanging out with the Kardashians. You want to hang yeah. out with Mother Teresa and Archbishop Tutu, the saints. Yes. yes. I still get excited when I think about it. Why would yeah. you want to be with Yeah, you've got, you've got the Archbishop Tutu. <laughs> you've got Martin King. You've got uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, Thomas Merton, Joan Baez, Jackson Brown, Martin Sheen. You've got uh, the. I, I'm geeking out about uh, the sign from William Stringfellow's cabin on Block Island. I can't believe that. I got and I, you let me touch it. So yeah, <laughs> that says Escaton. So it's just it's delightful, wonderful to be here. Thank thanks for having me. You're most welcome to your home here. It's really really a delight. So as you as you may know, on our show we uh, our tagline is exploring what it means to live a good life. And if one looks at your bio, <laughs> it's what arrested eighty something times, and um, so let's just start there. How do you see um, being in jail and prison that many times as part of a good life? Well, that's it's such a provocative question, and I love it. What is a good life? How do you live a good life? How do we live a good life today in this world? But it's been one of the key questions of my whole life since I was in college when I was a wild college kid at Duke in the 70s. Quite seriously, it was I was quite obsessed with it. And, you know, I, I was very politically aware as a kid. My life changed at nine years old with the assassination of Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy hmm. and the Vietnam War. And I went into an existential crisis and was looking for the meaning of life. And by the time I was at Duke in the 70s, wrestling with my, the guy who lived in the room next to me was went on to be a great man, Dr. Paul Farmer. We used to talk about, the, what are we going to do with our lives? How do you do a, have a good life? And here's what I want to say, because I've been, I don't know that anybody's ever asked me that. I know that you can't, so what, it, what help prevents you from a good life? Definitely ego, honor, and then greed and selfishness, selfishness and violence and being part of waging war, destroying the environment. But the flip side is also a problem, 
which is being nice. Huh. And this has always been my issue. Uh, I wait, wait, a, so just to make sure I hear that right. So on the flip side of all of those things, it seems... Uh, doing evil, doing actively evil, yeah. doing evil. It, it is also the issue of being nice. Right. And it's, which is a Southern thing, right? I think it's a, it's certainly an American thing, too. I grew up in the South in yeah. North Carolina. You know about that. And that's the problem. I mean, that's sin, <laughs> our problem is our virtue. Now, I'm saying all this because I had a friend named Gordon Zahn who wrote a book in 1960 called, it was the first of its kind, German Catholics and Hitler's War. And he said all the people of Germany who were Christian and Catholic were really nice, good people. Mm. And if you care about the world, we have to come to grips with that. They allowed the Nazis to come to power because they didn't do anything and they didn't rock the boat. They went to church and they were nice and quiet. And then they were Nazis mm. and they were they were the problem. And you go, oh, John, that's over the top. No, then you look at South Africa and you have Archbishop Tutu for a friend. And he's telling me these stories about, and I'm reading them and I remember them. Good white Christians in South Africa, going along, being very nice under apartheid. Mm. They are the problem. Martin Luther King said in the letter from the Birmingham jail, the, the problem was not the white races. You expect them to be insane. Mm. And the problem is not us, black people. We're being killed. The problem is good white church-going liberals. There's nothing worse because they... They are quite comfortable, and they just go, isn't that a shame? I had an, and forgive me for name drop, my other friend, William Sloan Coffin, who was a minister, famous, he, he said that a lot of us are the bystanders walking by the cross today. I have agonized over that my whole life. I don't want to be a good German. And so then I found Gandhi. Gandhi said in 1926, in the major trial, a, I think a life-changing teaching, he said, the world has now changed so much. There's so much evil. And here's his actual sentence. Non-cooperation with evil is as much a duty as cooperation with good. Hmm. He said, it's no longer, he said this in court. We have the transcript. It's no longer okay to say, I'm going to be a good person and lead a good life and do the good, the good, like Plato taught. That's not good enough. You have to also publicly, actively stand up against structured systemic evil. That's changed my life. And I mean, I, I read that in, when I was 21. Mm -hmm. I'm 63 now, and I got with the program. Mm -hmm. And so to do good means you have to do good, but you also have to publicly speak out, denounce, and take uh. action against systemic yeah. structured evil. And that's why I've gotten arrested and organized demonstrations and traveled to war zones around the world. Then it all makes sense. But if you look at the saints, you look at Gandhi and Dr. King, to the people you've named, I mean, to, to a blessing to know Archbishop Tutu or Thich Nhat Hanh or Daniel Philip Berrigan, for example, um, they're not uh, sitting around having a good time, yeah. although eventually they were. But their lives were under constant death threat. I, those people were some of the funniest people I ever met. Tutu's one of the funniest people I ever met. But he's been under, he was under death threat since he was 13. Mm. And Joan Baez says Martin Luther King is the funniest person she ever met. But you wouldn't <laughs> think that. But I get it. So my question is, your question, what is, how do you live a good life? Well, a good life is not the easy life. It's not being comfortable. And therefore, it's not about making money. I mean, we're being successful. Look at poor Elvis and Michael Jackson. We're not happy campers. And um, that doesn't work. But how do you live a good life in a world of 30 wars, 13,000 nuclear weapons, 4 billion people in subhuman poverty, racism, gun violence, child hunger? One could go on and on. And then catastrophic climate change. So for me, doing the good, the good life is actively working to make the world better. Yeah. So, and I can say yeah. a few more. If you well, want. I, I want to explore a lot of those things that you've already begun to point to. But before we do that, I want to, uh, before we move too much beyond your experiences as a younger person, um, 
What are some other, as you think back to childhood or early 20s, uh, are there other kind of key sources, authors, or experiences that led you to your sense of vocation, not only as a priest, but the the kind of priest you've been? Well, I was very influenced by Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. My father was in the leadership of the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., mm. so I grew up politicized. I grew up in that world. He was I, the the chair of the National Press Club in Washington. He's in the Board of Governors uh, yeah, and was huh. there. My fam- I come from an old newspaper family. Huh. So I grew up in Washington, D.C., in the most powerful hallways, literally the hallways, and was not impressed. And then I was very impressed with Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. And then we killed them. And I... Um, and you're how old when they get, nine. when they're killed? And I, I then, as I said, for ten years thought, well, if we kill and crush the greatest two people our country has ever produced, what can you do to make the world better? And I gave up hope for mm. making change and decided I'll just be a pious priest. Part of that, since you asked books, Paul Farmer and I used to read in college and talk at 3 a.m. in the middle of the fraternity party about Victor <laughs> Victor Frankl's The Meaning of Life. Wow. About like, This is the way we were. <laughs> there would be wild carousing going on. I'm going, but what about Victor Frankl? And I, we did an event at Harvard 10 years ago, and he told that story. And I, I forgot about it, but that's the way we were. And that's how you become Paul Farmer. Well, um, he's saying... The way to a good life is by living a meaningful life. Yeah. Find meaning in your life. So for me, then, the question was whether or not I make a difference, whether or not I can help end war, or I abolished all nuclear weapons. That's never <laughs> going to happen, right? But if I give my life to be on the side of ending war and nuclear weapons and hunger and racism and the destruction of the creatures, that's a good life. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned to you, I've been studying all my life the abolitionists. Yeah. Those people are nuts. <laughs> they came along, just little ordinary Quakers saying, oh, we're going to end slavery. <laughs> and everybody says, you can't do that. And then William Lloyd Garrison gives this big speech saying, we are announcing the abolition of slavery. This is in 1821. And they, you know, he lost his job. His home was burned down. And they said, no, we're going to do that. And... Uh, I think, to put it mildly, they led good lives. They spent their short Mm. time on earth working for something that was impossible, the abolition of slavery. You could talk about the suffragists, the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, people in the 70s who were giving their lives for the environment, for the poor, for anti-racism. Those are the saints of our time, and I wanted to be like that. uh, But there was an event I'll tell you that. Please. So uh, uh, just before I entered uh, the Jesuits in 1982 in the seminary to become a pious Catholic priest, um, my parents were upset about that, asked me to just get a job for a year and and not do this. So I worked for the Robert Kennedy family Hmm. because I was obsessed about Bobby Kennedy. And I got a little money. They only paid me $50 a week. And I told Mrs. Kennedy she still owes me. (laughs) And uh, I told her that last month, in fact. Um, And uh, I decided I would go and hitchhike through Israel to see where Jesus lived. Before I became a priest, I thought, that's a good thing yeah. to do. I'm 21. I went and told my parents. They were appalled. <laughs> I hitchhiked through Israel, the Holy Land, huh. for three months. And the week I left, summer of 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon. It was the summer war, and it was all orchestrated out of the Pentagon. We now know U.S orchestrated the killing of 60,000 people. All the Holy Land t- tour groups were canceled. The plane on which I flew over was practically empty. I would never do that now, what I did. I was so naive. I, all I had was a backpack, backpack with my Bible. I spent a week, a month walking through Jerusalem, then Bethlehem, then to Nazareth, and my goal was to camp out at the Sea of Galilee. Huh. And I get there, and there's nobody there. Because 15 miles away is the war. And I'm totally oblivious to this because I'm praying to Jesus and really like Jesus and going, this is so beautiful and this is so nice. 
I'm having a nice time. And then it was a Wednesday afternoon, July 1982. Really, for nobody miles around. Now it's the Sea of Galilee is all built up. Yeah. This was 40 years ago, 41 years ago. And um, there's a chapel on the North Shore. And I went in. And it's overlooking the sea, and there was nobody there. And it it said, a, there's a chapel of the, Beatitudes. It there? said right there on the walls, like graffiti, "Blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek and the gentle, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those persecuted for working for justice, and love your enemies on the altar." And it floored me because I was thinking, nice pious Christian priests. I'm going to be a nice guy. That doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> the point is to be persecuted for justice. The Beatitudes are the job description of the Christian. And we've done everything to ignore them. And I walked out on the balcony. Now, mind you, I'm looking out over the whole Sea of Galilee, and there's nobody. I was camping out there illegally for two weeks. And when you're on walking pilgrimage, you get crazier than usual. I'm talking to God and the sky. I'm going, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, you want me to do these things? Like, isn't that the job of Billy Graham or the Pope? Like, me? That was the breakthrough that huh. I had to, to take these teachings personally. This is what the poor guy really wants. And I said, okay. I'll dedicate my life to the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount and these teachings. Blessed are the peacemakers. Love your enemies. Hmm. Hunger and thirst for justice on one condition. If you give me a sign. Hmm. It was brilliant. <laughs> and dangerous. <laughs> no, no. The, you don't, the, the days of signs are over. There are no signs. I found a loophole, as <laughs> Helen Prejean said. And all of a sudden there were these loud explosions. Boom, boom, boom. I've told this story across the world. As three huge black Israeli jets fell from the sky, breaking the sound barrier, setting off sonic booms, swooping down over the Sea of Galilee, right over my head, and dropped bombs on the border of Lebanon. Huh. And I went, okay, this is serious. He's huh. serious about it. And, um, but, I, you know, I've spent my whole life thinking about that moment. That's why I'm here meeting with you today. I never intended to do this, but he actually is serious. Mm. About Blessed are the peacemakers and hunger and thirst for justice and love your enemies, yeah. which means don't kill them, which yeah. means you can't wage war, which means you can't build nuclear weapons. So, but I realize now that the war had been going on every hour and who cares? I didn't care. Yeah. I'd seen jets fly over, but instead of God appearing, I opened my eyes for one second hmm. to the reality of the world, just in case God appeared yeah. walking on the water. And what did I see? The reality of the world, which is mass murder. Sisters and brothers killing sisters and brothers for whatever reason, in the name of God, even at the very place where Jesus said, love your enemies, don't kill them. I saw bombing at the Sea of Galilee. And that's why I'm so passionate. Even 41 years later, I'm going to go to my death teaching the Sermon on the Mount saying, you cannot be a Christian and support war or killing or nuclear weapons. Jesus was totally nonviolent. If you want to be a Christian, you have to be totally nonviolent too. I ended the Jesuits a week later and I was a different person. I was meeting Daniel and Philip Berrigan. I got arrested at the Pentagon. I've been protesting war and organizing demonstrations ever since. And then I went to live in El Salvador at the height of the war and knew the six Jesuit priests who were later assassinated. So this is in the 1980s. Oscar, 1980s. Os Oscar Romero was killed was in, 19, dead then, yeah. in 1980. I think he, he was killed. I was lived there in 1985 and then went back twice a year for 20 years. I was really involved in El Salvador. But to have been, I, so to, so after all that, I went back and lived in a war zone. Yeah. And we were, they sent us to work in a refugee camp. So I was with the poorest of the poor, had lost all their families, and we were being bombed. And when the death squads came in, I'd, I was 22 with long blonde hair. I was to go out and talk to the death squads. Mm. And the thought was they won't kill anybody if I'm there because a white person is there. Mm. And that's what happened. I would talk. To, and Well, you talk about working through your nonviolence and mm. fear. <laughs> that was an education in the gospel. Yeah, I imagine. I imagine. What did you... Um, 
you brought up talking about working through your fear. How did you begin to learn to um, deal with deal with fear, move, move beyond the fear? Well, or- I had the most amazing teachers, starting with Daniel Berrigan, mm-hmm. whom I met very quickly. So he was he and his brother Phil were very famous in the 1960s, were on the cover of Time for being against the Vietnam War. They were the first priests in U.S., perhaps world history, to be publicly against war and get arrested at Catonsville, Maryland, for their protests, later for the Plowshares Movement, actually hammering on a nuclear weapon, which I then later did with Philip Bergen, and I myself faced 20 years in prison for that action. Mm. Um, but I met, met Dan. He was a Jesuit priest. I was a young Jesuit in training. He, he was my mentor and teacher. The other thing was, I, I know this, I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I'm trying to figure it all out. I was very passionate about Jesus and who is he? And I don't, I, I think Jesus is not who everybody says he is. Jesus to me, Jesus thinks he's Gandhi. <laughs> Can I say that on radio? <laughs> you just did. Jesus thinks he's Martin Luther King. Who does he think he is? I'm saying that to be silly, to get you to realize <laughs> Jesus taught total nonviolence, and then he organized a movement of poor people in Galilee and marched to Jerusalem and does nonviolent civil disobedience in the temple. You do that, you're going to be arrested and tortured and killed in 24 hours. That's a no-brainer. If you did that in apartheid South Africa or Civil War El Salvador, you're killed. And I'm with the Barrigans, who Dan was arrested 250 times. Mm. And the, the first night I met Dan, he said, "Why? what are you afraid of? He, he mm. said, you have to, you know, you're going to work for peace for the rest of your life. And I'm going, um, uh, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and he goes, what are you afraid of? Mm. Well, who says that? And then you know what he said to me? Don't be afraid. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for that. (laughs) Everybody needs a teacher to say to them, you don't have to be afraid. Dan was taught that by Dorothy Day. I was taught that by Daniel Berrigan, and then Tutu, and then Thich Nhat Hanh, and Coretta Scott King, and everybody. They told me that. And then I go and read Jesus, and what's the one thing he says more than anything in the four Gospels? Do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, because they're terrified. They're going to do civil disobedience. He could get killed doing this stuff. You mean offer no violent resistance to one who does evil? We have to nonviolently resist someone doing evil? Yeah. And even love them? Yeah. And forgive them? You're crazy. And yet, but he must have been a very charismatic, Mm. wonderful person that they would follow him. So if you're not dealing with fears and confronting fear uh, and resisting the culture of violence, I don't see how we're following Jesus. But it's only when you stand up publicly and get out of being just a nice person and being a good person. In fact, most people think you are evil. Dr. King was considered evil. Dan Berrigan was considered evil. Dorothy Day, you couldn't get more evil than she was a communist. Tutu, all our saints. Um. St. Francis of Assisi, the first five years of his life, he was stoned every day. Hmm. We forget that and go, wasn't he a nice guy? You probably would have wanted to stone him because <laughs> as you would have went on the side of killing Jesus. Why? Because he's saying, they're saying, in a world of total violence where so many are suffering, dying, to be good, to do the good, means to stop the killing. It's to work for the abolition of war, and poverty, and racism, nuclear weapons, environmental destruction, and therefore to actually engage the teachings of nonviolence of Jesus and work for a more nonviolent world. And that means grassroots movement building from Jesus to Dr. King, building nonviolent movements. That's how change happens. And then the minute you stand up publicly and say, stop bombing Iraq, stop bombing Afghanistan, or you hammer on a nuclear weapon like I did, all hell breaks out. Your family, your friends, church people, they all reject you. I've been kicked out of churches all across the country, and I'm banned from most military bases in the United States. And I feel like, well, maybe I'm following Jesus. Mm. He was killed. This is the job description. So uh, then, and only then, does the Gospels make sense. Why is Jesus saying, do not be afraid? Because I'm afraid. Well, you mean I don't have to be afraid, Dan? No, you can you can go to El Salvador. You can go to jail. In fact, you can, as Martin, <laughs> I used to be sitting in the jail cell and 
quoting Martin Luther, Martin Luther King gave this great speech in Detroit and said, we will transform those dungeons of darkness and despair into havens of hope and harmony. And I'd say, I don't think so, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> but I was trying to, you know, and we did, we were people of prayer and we did. Yeah. And you can, and uh, so much happens. And, and the perks, you meet great people and hello, a meaningful life. A good life. Yeah. I whether or not I have accomplished anything, I've certainly made no money. And I've done nothing <laughs> to show for myself. But I feel like I've carried on the legacy of the abolitionists mm. and Gandhi and Dr. King. And I want everybody to do that. It's not worth following any of our politicians. Follow Gandhi and King and yeah. Jesus and Dorothy yeah. Day, these great people. That and, and don't be afraid. What have you got to lose? You just have to be nonviolent. Yeah. That's the one catch. So one question that arises for me is, um, I mean, a lot, but here's the next one that arises for me. How, how does one avoid becoming one of those folks that um, sees being a troublemaker for the sake of being a troublemaker as opposed to being a, quote, troublemaker for the sake of peace and justice. Does my question make sense? Maybe. Do you want to give me examples of either of those? Um, we Clearly, Dr. King was committed to justice. Clearly. Justice. Clearly he was, yes. I guess, I guess what but, I'm asking— But maybe the students against the Vietnam War in the 60s, out in the streets yelling and carrying on, were not in it for the long haul. And they, you know, see, that's the yeah. problem. With, I mean, I don't know. I can't speak about it. Right. I, mean, I can't well, judge them. Right. But, yeah. and, and I'm not judging them either. But yeah. one of the problems in the movement is uh, people get out there and get real angry and maybe violent and yelling and screaming. And then they don't see any results and you give up. Or they do it for a while and you get like troublemaking for the sake of troublemaking. I'm talking about much deeper things. So here's a few yeah. thoughts. Yeah. Number one. I am trying to follow Jesus. So this is a spiritual practice. Peace and justice work for me is not uh, a strategy or a tactic or even a task, although it is a mission. It's God's work. I mean, for me, I'm just telling you how I see it. Because if it's not, then I would never stay involved. You give up real easy, and you just give in to anger and bitterness and burnout because you don't make any difference. Yeah. You, you make very little, and it's only the accumulation of millions of lives in the movements that lead to a Martin Luther King or Archbishop Tutu that bring the tie to end segregation or apartheid, for example. Um, and so our job is not to be those figureheads or to bring results, it's just do our part, is to do the good and resist evil and say our prayers. So we have to be a person of prayer. And, and you've, for a Christian, you study the life of Jesus and you see he's not tolerating injustice or lies. He has n and no violence. And he, all his teachings are meticulous nonviolence. So then you really work on your nonviolence. You're nonviolent to yourself, nonviolent to everybody you meet, and you're nonviolent to the creatures and to all of creation. You're trying to be like Gandhi and Martin Luther King as a way to be like all the saints, from St. Francis, St. Clair, to then Buddha and Jesus, total nonviolence, and be part then of the public grassroots movement. Um, but the goal is not trouble. The, and the one who explains it best is Martin Luther King in his letter from the Birmingham jail. He explains it all. It looks like trouble to the culture, but this is actually the way the healing happens. First of all, the goal for the Christian and for all of us is to proclaim the coming of a new world of peace and justice. We don't need a world of war and nuclear weapons. This is totally resolvable. We don't have to have all this gun violence or the sick racism or anyone starving. We have way more money to feed everybody if we only had the political will and the spiritual will. So we're talking about the reign of God. We're talking about, like the abolitionists, about abolishing slavery, just doing the hard work of building a movement and creating the global political will to end war itself and institute nonviolent conflict, resolu conflict resolution programs institutionalized around the world. And then no more nuclear weapons and um, no more starvation and a world of genuine equality and dignity. All that's doable. Um, so then you need deep, deep spiritual roots. And um, if you step out publicly to be part of that, 
in a world of total violence and war and racism, everyone's going to say you're causing trouble. It's so interesting because Martin Luther King says brilliantly in the letter from the Birmingham jail, I came in to Birmingham and they're saying, you're dividing us. And he says, you're the most segregated, divided city in the United States, and I'm dividing you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, hello. Right. And I come in, and all hell breaks loose. Oh, okay. So, and I'm I'm gentle and nonviolent. You're the ones blowing up every black church, all trying to kill all the black pastors. Seriously, it was total terrorism, white terrorism. And he says this brilliant line: "The work of the peacemakes here." <sighs> I don't know how Martin Luther King thinks this up. He goes, we are a doctor lancing a boil on the body politic. Mm. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. And when you lance the boil of segregation and racism, there's going to be a lot of pus. Uh. And it's going to be messy. And only when it can come out can the healing begin. Mm. So you're going to kill Jesus and kill Dr. King for them trying, stirring up trouble. And that's how the movements begin. And so what if people want to live a good life, I think they should drop what they're doing and think of the global good for the whole planet and human race and get with the program to the big issues. That's where the action yeah. is to end war and poverty and racism and nuclear weapons, environmental destruction. And then when trouble happens, when people get mad at you, when you're family walks away from you, you get kicked out of your church, you lose your job, now you get to be nonviolent. Yeah. And then more friends show up, and then you're part of the movement, and then you're beginning to understand what Gandhi and King and Tutu went through, and then you, be, you, know, you become a mature human being. This is the journey to be, being human in an inhuman time. Mm. Things like that. So I can imagine another objection might be something like, um, I mean, it could, it could take a couple of shapes. So let me. You don't have okay. to play the devil. Yeah. Hand. So wait. <laughs> well, I'm just imagining people listening and and them asking certain questions, and I want to I want to hear hear what you what you you know because I'm I'm sure you've heard all of these right, uh, but what about you know those who have said to you. Um, at one extreme, they might just say, this is outrageous and it's irrelevant what you're doing. And then others might say, um, I'm with you on what you want to accomplish, but a better way to accomplish it is through working within the system. I've heard all of that and a million more yeah. every single day of my life. It's such a strange life. So ever since I came back from Galilee when I was 21, I entered the Jesuits. I start saying, we got to weep for peace. Every single day, someone has tried to talk to me about why we need to kill. Huh? But, you know, if you work within the system, so it's... It, I remember leaving Mass once. I preached against the war in Iraq and New Mexico 20 years ago. And this mother of the, the kid who was dropping bombs in Iraq said, she's holding the, her son's baby. Can't we just bomb them all? Is it just collateral damage? I said, but we just had communion. Mm. Which I thought was pretty funny. Like, what the hell are we doing then? Who do you think you are? We are no. There's no working within the system. If Jesus worked in the system, I do that. It, he wasn't for reforming the Roman Empire or the Jewish authorities who were working with the empire to oppress and steal all the money from the poor in this very convoluted temple system. In order to go in and meet God, you had to give them all your life savings. But since you're so horrible. We can't use your evil money. We have our own holy money. So we have to have our own banking system. But we're going to have to charge you a little bit more to use our, if you want to use our holy. I mean, it's incredible. All forgotten. He turned over the tables of the money changers. He's not working within the system. He's outside the system. He's on the margins. He's a grassroots movement leader. That's why I say he's like Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It's why I never ran for office and why Dr. King never ran for office. You know, I was interested in Bobby Kennedy, but I thought those days were over. Once we killed Bobby Kennedy, I saw the Vietnam War. I saw Richard Nixon. And once you have Nixon, then you have Ronald Reagan and George Bush and George Bush, W. Bush and killing 1.5 million Iraqis and people in Afghanistan and Trump 
and now blowing up the world in catastrophic climate change. There's a direct lineage. We can go farther back to Hiroshima and World War I and slavery. But the system is totally broken. Dorothy Day said all our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system. I knew that as a boy because I grew up in D.C. and saw I was not impressed by anybody except for Bobby Kennedy and um, Martin Luther King. Okay. And so uh, what was your other question besides the system? That, that it was outrageous. but Oh, but, well, but, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, everybody but, tells me it's yeah. outrageous. But yeah. I'm going, well, what are you doing with your right, life? Right. And, by, and, and what do you think of Jesus? And by the way, he said, love your enemies. And by the way, this was my big problem with Viktor Frankl. We're all going to die someday. I could not find one person in history who has not died. Apparently, every human, this is what I used to talk about with Paul Farmer, we're all going to die, and then we're going to meet Jesus, or Buddha, or God as infinite universal love, and she's going to say, what did you do with the time on earth? And I thought as a kid, I better get with the program. I don't want to say that I wasted my life making money, especially when it doesn't work. Yeah. I don't see rich people as happy people. I don't see... I don't see anybody in the culture. I see very few happy people in this culture. And in fact, as I travel the, the global south, the real poor of the world, they're much happier because they've been forced to surrender their lives to God in ways we have not yet. But so, yeah, it's uh, the real question is you're making no difference. And that's when I say, it's not up to me. All I'm called to do is, you know, I don't have to... Uh, be effective or have results, that's in God's hands. I'm just called to be faithful to this way of nonviolence from Jesus to Dr. King and to sow seeds of peace and nonviolence in a world of war and hope that someday a new generation will, of move, people will rise up and abolish nuclear weapons once and for and war and institutionalize nonviolence. And nonviolence will be the norm for every major religion in the world as it should be, that every Christian would be nonviolent which means the end of greed and violence and guns and racism. And um, I don't know anything else more hopeful to do with one's life, you know. I'm actively not going along with the functional despair of our culture, and it may look what crazy. Do you, what do you mean by that functional despair? I'm having a good time is what yeah. I'm trying to oh, tell yeah, you. Yeah. And <laughs> these saints are too. I'm a, we have a lot more fun. Tutu was a lot of fun to be with. I think everybody's in despair. I mean, the most, let's say, are the people where we had a campaign for 20 years at Los Alamos in New Mexico, mm. where they build all the nuclear weapons. There are more millionaires per capita there, that little town on the mountaintop, than anywhere else on Earth. And it's the, one of the highest cancer rates on Earth. And more PhDs per capita than anywhere else on Earth. They all build nuclear bombs, 25,000 people. And they're all Catholic and Christian. Everyone goes to church. They love God. They're really nice. Mm. And they build nuclear bombs to vaporize people. I think it's the biggest terrorist training camp on the planet. It's hell on earth, and people don't realize it, and they don't even know what's happening to them. Gandhi said, Why? on August 6, 1945, the day that we dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, he said, well, we've seen the effects, uh, uh, the physical effects on the bomb on the people who were vaporized in Japan. It's too soon to say the spiritual effects upon the people who made the bomb. Well, 75 years later, we're seeing it. I think people in this country have lost faith in a God of universal love and peace. They're losing their spiritual lives. Like, as Gandhi said, they're losing their souls. And I see it in this, what I call functional despair, which is you go around, there's, there's no hope. Whether you're rich or very poor, there's nothing you can do. And that's exactly what the culture of violence and war wants us to mm. think. Yeah. There's no, you can make a difference. And if you're like me, look how crazy he is. Thomas Merton said, and if, if everybody is insane in the world, the one or two sane people will be t called insane. Mm. That's the way I relate to the yeah, world. Yeah. I sometimes feel, this is, I maybe shouldn't say it, but I feel like I'm walking through a, a zombie movie. The people are going crazy. And that's why Pope Francis talked about the role of the church now is um, a field hospital because everybody is going crazy with violence toward themselves, in their families, so much hatred. 
and now killings and then all these w- third world war and piecemeally calls it nuclear weapons and destroying the planet. So um, the question for me, the thing that's more difficult for me is good people who are actively supporting evil. In other words, priests, ministers, bishops, who are totally for racism, dropping bombs on people in Iraq or Afghanistan, places I've been, I've known a lot of people killed in both places, especially Iraq. And, um, you know, being for catastrophic climate change and supporting just rageous corporate greed and lies, fascism, I don't understand how they can say they're following the nonviolent Jesus who teaches peace and love. That's the most disturbing thing yeah. for me. To be outrageous, though, is just part of the territory. Yeah. I think Jesus was very outrageous. Yeah. What? Um, in what ways has your faith and work been nourished by the church, and in which ways has it been discouraged by the church? <laughs> Do you have another question for me? <laughs> That's really the hardest question. I don't know if you want to get in that we, on your show. We can, but we can, we can if go If you want on. me to, I'll try. Here goes. Okay. That's the problem. I'm trying to change the church. In a nutshell, I think Jesus was totally nonviolent. And so for the first three centuries, the early church was a community, an underground, illegal grassroots movement, which was totally nonviolent, which meant you couldn't, fight in the Roman army. And you couldn't be a Roman citizen. You were saying, our guy's God, not Caesar. And they chopped your head off that afternoon. And then supposedly the emperor Constantine in 315 supposedly says, I'm now a Christian and you can all be legal now. And so you can all join the Roman army. And everybody went, oh, thank God. And then he said, you don't need the Sermon on the Mount anymore. In effect, this is what he said. He threw out the Sermon on the Mount and he said, Sometimes you need to kill. And he turned to the pagan Cicero and he said, you know, you can be good and kill the enemy sometimes. And that was the beginning of the just war theory, which has nothing to do with the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus didn't say, love your enemies, but if they're really bad and you follow these seven conditions, bomb the hell out of them. (laughs) Jesus said, that's the whole point. Love your enemies. You can't kill them. Go and meet them and be with them. I've done that and it works. So for 1,700 years, all the churches have rejected the Sermon on the Mount. And I would say all of them, because even today, the the historic peace churches are very quiet and not very active. And I've said that to them. Um, So it's bad. (laughs) The church has supported enslaving human beings, burning women at the stake. Name any other evil you wish to name. Every war. I mean, in the Middle Ages, we had crusades. The cardinals led the battles. And we're trying to kill Muslims and teach them how to do that. As if as Jesus didn't come to teach us how to kill. He came to teach us how to love and live and how to die and how to be nonviolent. So, but what's happening now with the last century is so hopeful and amazing. We're in a paradigm shift in history because we've been forced with Hiroshima and Nagasaki to come to grips with the power of methodology of nonviolence, which is the way of God that Jesus outlined in the Sermon on the Mount. And Gandhi showed can be applied to the nation state level. So Gandhi gets the British to leave India nonviolently. He leads a nonviolent revolution. And Martin Luther King leads, in effect, a nonviolent revolution in the United States against organized legal segregation. And he does it nonviolently. And now there have been 100 nonviolent revolutions and movements since the 60s There's more happening now than ever. And um, that gives me hope. And I've known, even though things are bad in the church and so many priests, ministers, and bishops are all for war and killing and completely misunderstood Jesus, in my opinion, there are those who have gone ahead of us who have taught this spectacular vision of nonviolence and have tried to apply it to our times. I would say from Martin Luther King and Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker to Oscar Romero of El Salvador and Archbishop Tutu of South Africa um, and many, many, many other people. Um, And I've met a lot of them and have been encouraged by 
ordinary people doing extraordinary things and seeing how there's power in nonviolence. I've been really discouraged and hurt by hundreds and hundreds of priests, ministers, bishops, and cardinals. I just came back from the Vatican three weeks ago. I've been, some friends and I are, have been engaging Pope Francis and the, the cardinals in the Vatican to get the church to officially renounce the just war theory and adopt Jesus' way of nonviolence. We helped Pope Francis write the first statement on nonviolence in the history of the Catholic Church, hmm. I think since the Sermon on the Mount. Hmm. Came out in New Year's Day 2017. We're trying to get him to write an encyclical. That's never happened before in history. It's exciting to be part of it. And even though so I've been banned, I was banned by the Catholic bishops of Kansas from giving a retreat to 2,000 people on Jesus <laughs> in the state of Kansas because I have a, okay, I have a criminal record, but I, I did I never got to explain to them that <clears throat> Jesus did too. <laughs> That's the, like, how can you be follow the guy if you don't? I mean, I, uh, Martin, I'm way ahead of Mark in his arrest, Martin Luther King. This is part of what it means to live the good life and have a good time. Anyway, uh, it's amazing. And I've been really hurt, really, really hurt. I'm laughing about this, but really hurt by so many priests and bishops and Jesuits and who've and done a lot of evil things. Yeah. Like uh, I was leading protests outside, I'll say one story, outside of Los Alamos. So the Jesuits sent a Jesuit inside to help build nuclear weapons with full security clearance inside, a priest. I remember when I was a kid, I said to the Jesuit superior, Father Leo Donovan, I wanna spend my life like Gandhi and Dr. King teaching nonviolence as a way to help People learn the Sermon on the Mount. And he stood up and said, Jesuits and priests are not nonviolent. And he kicked me really hard in the shin and said, let me see you be nonviolent now. Now, I could tell you 200 stories like that, and you wouldn't believe me. I had thousands of people walk out on me and many death threats. But I've known a lot of people killed. And if you knew these great saints too, and if you were reading the gospel the way I do, you go, this is just the job description. Now I'm getting somewhere. So even though there's many problems with the church, I don't focus on the church. I focus, if, as you hear me talking, mm -hmm. I'm focusing on the nonviolent Jesus, God as a God not of war, but as a living God of peace. The scandal of Jesus is God is totally nonviolent, and to be human is to be nonviolent. The church is supposed to be the community of friends for helping each other be nonviolent and go into the world and end all the violence and wars. And um, so I'm spending my life trying to change that. Wish me luck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned a moment ago um, the notion of or the practice of being nonviolent to oneself. Mm -hmm. So would you talk a little bit about what that looks like for you and also what are other practices, disciplines, resources that have helped you dealing with your own pain uh, in the, some of these cases you just talked about um, of helping you navigate your own understandable anger if that's arisen in you towards such things. Uh, but so, so just I'm asking generally about kind of the tapestry of your inner life and the work wow. that you've done. Wow. Um, thank you. Um, that's an awful lot. I, so I've been talking about this Gandhi Kingian way of nonviolence publicly for over 40 years now. And Gandhi would say nonviolence is causing no injury in thought, word, or deed. And uh, Dr. King would say it's organized goodness, an act of love and pursue the truth of our common human unity, that mm. we're all one, all sisters and brothers of one another. So with Gandhi and Dr. King, I see his nonviolence as active love, universal love, but with the one catch that there's uh, uh, no cause, however noble, no matter what they say, for which we will ever again support the taking of a single human life. We do not support the killing of human beings. We give our lives to stop the killing. So it's active love. Okay, so fine, I'm out there talking about that and I'm saying nonviolence then is, it's a way of life, it's a spiritual path, it includes our spirituality and theology, God is nonviolent, but it's also a political methodology, a positive social transformation where you can actually 
through nonviolent means end slavery and segregation and get Marcos, say, the dictator in the Philippines, to leave in three days through the ordinary people mm -hmm. power movement of the Philippines in the 1980s. That's one of a hundred examples I could give you. This stuff works when it's tried. Well, then I, I, but I faced so many people on this that I wrote this book called The Nonviolent Life. And I came up this theory to try to explain nonviolence in my ordinary words. And what I say is it has three simultaneous attributes. You have to do all three. And I've actually already referred to that. Number one, you have to be really nonviolent to yourself. At the same time, number two, you have to be meticulously nonviolent toward every human being, everyone you know, in all your relationships, and then nonviolent to the creatures, and then nonviolent to Mother Earth. And then third, at the same time, see, even that is not enough. That's the question of being nice and good and like a, a silent Quaker. That's still not it. You have to have third, one foot in the global grassroots movement for justice and discernment and peace. So like the Quakers in England in the 1700s were working to end slavery. They got out of their virtue and became public troublemakers. And they did it. And they did it without having a civil war, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Amazing people. So you're asking me about the first part. And it's taken me a light, long life. I was raised in a violent home. Um, I know about violence and I've struggled to be nonviolent all my life. And um, while I'm teaching it publicly, and then I want to be able to stand up publicly in a demonstration. And when you do that, people are going to come up in our country and spit at you and call you every name in the book. And you got to be ready. If you're not prepared doing your inner work, your inner violence is going to be triggered and yeah. you're going to lash out at a person, which is what this is the story of activists around the world. You see violent people on the streets for a just cause. That doesn't help. That's not peacemaking. So it's critical this, uh, from Jesus to Gandhi that you're working on a nonviolent heart. So how do you do that? So that's why Thich Nhat Hanh taught me this. He had this beautiful phrase, just look deeply within. So you, you're mean to somebody or you snap at somebody, you get angry at somebody or, or you're just leaving church and you want to run over them in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, did I touch I a nerve? I thing? have no idea what you're <laughs> talking about. <laughs> and um, okay, then you're going to beat yourself up. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm a terrible person. I ate myself. So then you're just, it's all the cycle of violence. We've all, we're all victims of this horrible culture and world of violence. All of us. Some of us actually from being hurt by our mothers and fathers physically, but certainly all by the culture in our youth, and then maybe through sexism or racism, or just growing up in the Vietnam War or any war. It, does, it destroys your spirit, and it normalizes you to violence, as if it's okay to be violent. Or actually, we're just born violent. Baloney. Um, we're born nonviolent, and to be human is to be nonviolent. So you don't beat yourself up. You look in deep within, you go, why did I do that? Well, then you, you're on the path of becoming a contemplative. Hmm. And that's where you have to look within and you go, oh, see, violence stays in, 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 and grows inside us and until someday it, it ripens and comes out. It always comes out. That's what everybody, that's what all the teaching is. So, uh you look inside and you go, well, that's because two weeks ago somebody put me down and I walked away, but it hurt me. You have to like forgive that person in your heart, pray for them, give them to God and let it go. And once you do that, then you're constantly disarming your heart. And then I learned as I entered the seminary, the power of what I call meditation. So quiet prayer, I was taught to do 30 to 60 minutes a day when I was 21, that's my practice or Gandhi did two hours a day, that's what I'm trying to do now, which is just sit with the God of peace. And the reason we don't want to do that is because all our junk comes up. Yeah, All this inner chaos and violence is inside us. You sit down in silence and imagine you're with God and you're going, wait, I got to wait. I'm a I got to go. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm way too busy for this. Sorry, God. Or I hate this person so much. Where did that come from? Or 
you know, your conservative or liberal politics come up. It's all violence to me. And the God of peace disarms you. Mm. And that's what happens in meditation. You learn to, you are disarmed over time and your heart is disarmed. And actually you're given a spiritual gift of peace. And then you can step out publicly into the world and be more peaceful and nonviolent. Now, I've known some of these great teachers. I've actually had this conversation with them many years over my whole life. And they've taught me how they did this. So I know this works. I know people in Gandhi's family who did this. Mm -hmm. I know all of Dr. King's friends and they do this. So I found this works. So I have to have meditation every day. I have to do a lot of inner reflection. If I get angry, well, this is a big conversation I had with Tutu. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, don't get angry. You've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. I say, don't even get angry. Instead, when you have somebody who's angry with you, somebody is upset with you, whatever you do, don't worship God. Go, and in the Greek, it's katagalite, be reconciled. You're going, holy Toledo, what are you talking about, Jesus? Don't kill, don't get angry, don't worship God. Before you do anything, be reconciled with the people you have hurt. Your own anger should make you think about all the people you've mm. hurt, and we've all hurt a lot of people. So we should be apologizing, making restitution. We should forgive everyone who ever hurt us. We should be uh, constantly allowing God to disarm our hearts, and then really thinking through nonviolence, training in nonviolence, going to workshops, reading all the many new books about it, studying how the methodology of nonviolent movements work. Read Gandhi and Dr. King. Read their biographies if you have it. And then you learn this is doable. And by the way, you're a little happier. <laughs> you know, going around being mean and grouchy and hating everybody is not a happy yeah, life. Yeah. And it doesn't work. And I'm tired of that. And by the way, too, being an old guy, I've been at this since I was a kid. And I've seen... 25 wars. I, I've been in court hundreds of times. I've seen a lot of pain. And it makes you angrier. Yeah. If you want to stay in the struggle, you're going to get even more upset. And Gandhi said, Jesus said all of this. I'm not kidding you. Gandhi explained Jesus saying, don't go with the anger route because it won't sustain you for the long haul. Mm. You need something deeper. And that's grief. I've only learned that in the last 10 years. Mm. You have to start grieving what we're doing to the poor of the world, what we're doing to Mother Earth. And so here in the U.S., we have to become people who, who practice grief. Because grief breaks our hearts, and then we can become compassionate, and then we become human and more loving. And then, besides not getting angry, we can cultivate joy. And that's in the Beatitudes, too. When they call you names for standing up for justice, rejoice and be glad. Now you're like the prophets of old. Now you're like Martin Luther King. Be joyful. So I have a lot. That's what Tutu and I talked about. We have a lot of joy. We get to be like Gandhi and King mm. because everybody's pissed off at us. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we're against war. Yeah. <laughs> You'd think they'd want to give us the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, they get it to him, but not because he was against war. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I could go on and on if you want me well, to. Well, it really I mean you've really ruined my self-righteous anger because you've you've oh, said yeah. now that I, have I to, tried all now that. It I doesn't have, work. Now I have to turn around and think about the ways I've messed up other people. So yeah. You, oh gosh. Yeah. I I you know, I have so many regrets. I've done so much good and I've hurt so many people along the way with my self-righteousness. So when I say these things, I it sounds glibly, but it's not. I mean, I've been I mean and I've seen a lot in the movement and I've been very self-righteous all my life, and I don't want to do that anymore. I still want to be passionate for justice and discernment, but I want to do it with humility and grace and kindness. And only our saints manage that level. Um, Martin Luther King really was a nice guy, according to everybody who knew him. Tick not on. When I, the last, I was with him shortly before he had a stroke. I spent a day with him in France in his hermitage, and I remember sitting there laughing with him and thinking, this is what it must have been like to be with Gandhi or Jesus, because he was so gentle. But he helped end the Vietnam War. Yeah. And he knew 1,000 people, starting with his brother, who were killed by Americans. He should have been insane. 
Do you see there's a way beyond yeah. anger and self-righteousness where you can actually make a difference, but you're actually peaceful and happy and 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 Tutu and Thich Nhat Hanh and Dan Bergen were like that till their deaths. Mm. And that's what I want to be like. Say a yeah. prayer that I make it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, but I, I, it's a very serious question. So I, I'm doing a lot, actually a lot more inner work yeah. than I do in my public work. But that's because I'm so passionate about all this because I really am a broken yeah. person yeah. and a violent person who wants to be nonviolent. And I have to figure it out for myself and then I've just said, well, okay, well, I'm at it. I might as well share what I'm learning yeah. and my books and my talks around the world. Um, my friend Henry Nowen used to say, we're all wounded. So the question is, are you going to be a wounded wounder or a wounded healer? Mm. And that was a helpful teaching too, that we do want to keep wounding people, even in a good cause. No, I want to heal people and I want to be healed in myself along the way. And that's, I'm finding you can do that. Yeah. You can be peaceful while working for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Yes, yeah, right, yeah. Um, at the very top, we talked about a, a good life, and one of the things you've, that's kind of been a thread through what we've discussed today is the joy and the fun that you've had, and a lot of that joy and the fun is in the community of friends that you've developed. And so, uh, and, I, and I even talked about some of the pictures on the wall that you shared with me as we came in this afternoon. But let me just kind of give you... Um, Give me like one phrase of something that stands out about their joy or their personality or their character of some of these folks. So Dan Berrigan, one of your one of your We friends. just laugh so yeah. much. And you can ask Martin Sheen that too. Yeah, yeah. Martin said publicly once Daniel Berrigan was the funniest person he ever met. But in the 70s, Dan Berrigan would be the way we look at, say, Julian Assange or Edmund Snowden now. And I know Julian Assange, and I know him well, and God bless Julian. You were scared of Daniel Berrigan. He was a priest because he was against the Vietnam War, and he was saying strong things. And you can't go to church on Sundays and then be all for sending your neighbor's kids to kill in Vietnam on Monday. That's insane. And But then when you were with him, he loved good food and friends <laughs> and told hilarious jokes and boy, did that sustain us. Well, then everybody I was with was like that. Yeah. All the great people I've been are a lot of fun to be with. And Dan told me that when I was 21. Huh. He said to me, John, if you're going to spend your life resisting death, you better learn how to live life to the full. Huh. Huh. And I, so why I've been so lucky is I, when I was 21, decided, I, I don't know why, I, to meet all these great people and to just, just jump ahead and not, uh, from their mistakes hmm. and really take their teaching seriously. And just so I can make, just move on yeah, yeah. and be with them and, and be like them. And so I've been having a good time ever <laughs> since. And I, you know, I mean, we, we just have so many for you asked Martin Sheen getting arrested together. We still laugh over some of the things <laughs> with Cesar Chavez. I mean, all of these people, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh was telling me, he goes, just the day I was with him, the, before, two months before his stroke, you were in his room, he goes, everybody thinks I'm so peaceful. <laughs> and I'm sitting here and they think, I shouldn't tell you this story. <laughs> well, you've already started. I, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm here in the lotus position, but I'm just really lazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I burst out laughing. And he goes, John... I'm all for Jesus. I'm just trying to get everybody in the world to follow Jesus. I said, Ty, I'm just trying to get Catholics to be good Buddhists, <laughs> to learn <laughs> compassion and, and to be nice and, com and to be in the present moment. And we just roared laughing. <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Yes. Uh, Fred Rogers. Oh, Fred Rogers. <laughs> I met Fred Rogers at Henry Nowen's funeral. We were both doing the prayers for the faithful. He said, oh, you have to call me. Okay, I called him. And then he liked to call in the middle of the night. <laughs> and um, and I, I, you know, I was friends with him until he died. You know, the month he died, he was writing to me. And, I, you know, I went to events with him. And he was so nice. Now, mind you, I'm an ex-con, right? I'm getting arrested. And a lot of people don't like me. 
<laughs> Even though I'm such a nice guy. <laughs> no, but Fred saw through it. Fred knew all about me through our friend and my po- political work. And he's not doing public work like that. But he totally understood that I'm trying to follow Jesus. And he's going, John, you're doing it. I mean, he said incredible, beautiful things for me. And he changed my life. Actually, I'll tell you quite honestly, because he and Mother Teresa affirmed me more than any other two people I've ever met. And Fred Rogers, I never even watched this TV show. I didn't even really know him. (laughs) And he's going, you're it. You're a total peacemaker. Keep doing it. Don't ever stop. I'm totally for you and support you. And then, you know, I remember at one event in New York City, he... uh, he called me and invited me to come as his guest, and there were a lot of people there. And he pulled out one of those little, this was in the 90s, one of those little Instamatic cameras. <laughs> he starts taking all these pictures of my face. Really, like, what are you doing? You're crazy. And then, you know, he had one of his Mr. Rogers Neighborhoods framed show. It came in the mail with my picture, and he'd written in Koine Greek all these words about love and peace. I don't know anybody that's, like that. That's, that's a hilarious. lot of fun. That's hilarious. To get Koine Greek from Fred Rogers is something. That's why I'm telling you, there's perks if you work to get rid of poverty, <laughs> racism, war, and nuclear weapons. Forget everything in yes, this darn yes, culture and get yes. with the program. It reminds and me. if you're not sure, call me up. Yeah, look me up on the network. It, net, it net, does internet, remind me, a folks. couple of years ago, I interviewed Ben Cohen of Ben and Jerry's. Yeah, and and he, he he has this line about the joyful journey for justice. He got that from I'm, Daniel Berrigan. Did he really? Because he learned that, that, that Dan sustained everybody. Yeah. Ben Cohen it, it, it learned so much from these great people that in 1992, he and Ben and Jerry's set up ice cream named after the top 10 greatest activists in the country. You may have remembered it because it was a TV commercial. So Dan Berrigan had ice cream named after him. He did? He did. But, and then got... Unlimited ice cream till the day he died. That's hilarious. I didn't and know. And Jerry did. Garcia. Yeah, yeah, I knew about Jerry, Jerry Garcia. Jerry Garcia, Pete Seeger, Dolores Huerta. I know all of these people. Carlos Santana, um, Spike Lee, uh, Huey Newton, uh, and, <laughs> and and that was Ben and Jerry. But like ice cream for life, yeah, right? But but that was the teaching of Dan. And it's also the teaching of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. I've come that they may have life and life to the full, which means I've come to stop death. And Dan used to say what we're up against is death. I want to quote a poem to you. My favorite is uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay. A hundred years ago, she was a famous peace activist in Greenwich Village against the war and women didn't have the right to vote. And she had this uh, incredible poem called Conscientious Objector. And the first sentence is the story of my Christian journey. She said, I shall die, but that is all I shall do for death. And that's what I'm trying to get at. We are non-cooperating with death and the metaphors and means of death through war and racism and guns and nukes and anything that hurts people. And we're living life to the full. We're not waiting for the kingdom of God when we die. Hello, it's already here if you want it, which means having nothing to do with death and living life to the full and making friends with every human being on the planet, living like Jesus, unconditional, universal, nonviolent love, making peace with everyone, with yourself, and then with the creatures and Mother Earth and the ocean and the sky. And you end up like Thich Nhat Hanh. And Gandhi. And what's not to like? Yeah. Why would you want to be like anybody else? <laughs> Forget the superheroes yeah. in the movies. These guys are much greater. Yeah. So I have a lot of hope and joy, oddly enough. <laughs> Give us, um, as we get toward our close here, um, let me just ask you a few other kind of odd, 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 odds and ends questions. Um, music. What's some music that's been a lot to Why you? Why are you asking me that? <laughs> I, I don't know what you're gonna, what or who you're going to say. Well, I was a musician growing up. And my a magician? A musician. A musician. Oh, a musician growing I up. I was a musician growing oh. up. Huh. And I What did you play? I wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> I played piano and guitar, and I wrote songs. And my younger brother played drums and um, 
bass and we built a recording studio. Huh. And then I started like the Yale Whiffing Poofs, the Duke Pitchforks at Duke. And I recorded regularly in recording studios. Huh. I brought in musicians. And then I took my tapes to New York City. Huh. And this was, I was thinking, I didn't tell you this, that I was either going to be a newspaper publisher like my father or probably a politician or a rock star. <laughs> and I ended up becoming a priest. It was a big setback. Which and I gave it a huge all. <laughs> a huge setback. <laughs> Boy, was. So I threw literally threw it all away. My all, whole all life, your, yeah. everything I ever did, all the tapes and everything. You and threw that you literally threw them away? Yeah. And then one day in 1989, through Martin Sheen, we're getting arrested at the federal building and Los Angeles protesting U.S. military aid to El Salvador. I'd known the Salvadoran Jesuits who were killed. And I mean, one of my idols was Jackson Brown, who was a, very famous in the 70s. It's a rock singer. He used to play all his songs. Yeah. I could do any of yeah, him. Yeah, sure. And, and there he was in jail with me. And then <laughs> I said, we, we're having a big protest for Romero's 10th anniversary. Will you come? Yeah, I'll come. And we've been friends ever since. And I met through him. What? Jerry Garcia and Bonnie Raitt. And later on my own, I met Bruce Springsteen and Paul McCartney. I haven't met Bono, but they're doing really good work. So, and you've got a letter uh, from Joan Baez. No, uh, Joan is my friend. Joan has yeah. been passionate about nonviolence her whole life. You should have Joan on your show. I would love to have Joan on And the show. Uh, I don't know if you'll, she'll do it, but she's retired now. But she's a great, great, great figure. Totally deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. Close friend of Martin Luther King to Vaclav Havel to mm. name anybody in the world, yeah. the Dalai Lama. And I've known her for maybe 30 years. And she's helped me a lot on various projects that I don't even remember now. But so I love music and I can't do any of this without music. It's always been in my life. I gave it all up, but I was facing 20 years in prison at one point. And I then was in kind of a solitary confinement, only I was in a tiny cell with Philip Berrigan. We never left for eight months. Mm. After that experience, I said, I'm going to have music back in my life. <laughs> so and now I have music back in my life, and I go to concerts, and I yeah. see my friends in concerts, and I listen to the Beatles and U2 and Bob Dylan. I love them yeah. all every single day. What are some of your particular favorite songs? Wow. Well, I'm a Beatles fanatic, Yeah. so I love... You know, it depends on my mood, but I love from, <laughs> I can't believe you asked him, Hey Jude and Let It Be to George Harrison's My Sweet Lord. I love U2's Pride in the Name of Love. And, um, you know, I love Bob Dylan's Every Grain of Sand. I don't mm. know if you know that song or Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. Mm. These are incredible pieces of work and helpful. Yeah. Helpful to get us at the truth and the, the point of a good life. Yeah. And, you know, when you have really good music, like these artists that I've just named, they're where there's no violence, but actually like pride in the name of love saying, in the name of love, what more in the name of love? It's a song about Martin Luther King and Bono singing about Dr. King. That helps me, inspires me to, to try to give my life in the yeah. name of universal love. And um, I like music like that. And so that's, folk rock and those great people. And I've met musicians just because when you're in the movement, movement you meet musicians. Yeah. Again, perks. I never <laughs> thought I'd get to meet Jackson or Joan Baez or all the other rock stars yeah. I know. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, but they're involved. They feel about the movement too. And, and what was so upsetting is to discover they're much more committed to the way of Jesus for the Beatitudes than so many priests, ministers, and bishops mm. and ordinary Catholics in this time who actually are going along and being nice and supporting then yeah. racism, police violence, and actually supporting nuclear weapons and our wars by their ignorance and silence and what the way we're destroying the planet. That's why I said at the beginning, a good life is not a comfortable life. It's not an easy life. It's not going along and not rocking the boat. A good life rocks the boat and disrupts, disturbs the peace. So you end up being a public disturber of the peace and plumbing the inner depths of peace beyond your own even knowing and, and, and seeing new horizons of peace 
through the great people as I've traveled the world that you didn't know were possible too, and therefore moving closer to the God of peace. Mm. Um, so a good life is looks like an uncomfortable bad life, but it's much better yeah. than what appears to be the good life, which is <laughs> rich, being successful. That's a failed life. If you're rich and successful and powerful, you failed. If you're poor and struggling for justice and peace and being loving and kind and gentle and teaching nonviolence far and wide, and your very presence like the Buddha and Thich Nhat Hanh is disarming, you're leaving a good life. And you will have a good death because in your death, uh, you're going to bear good fruit. Even your death will help people and people will, be, will look mm. at the gift you've given and that's what we should do with the short time we have on earth. Try to make life easier and better for others. We've been talking to John Deere at his home here in Morro Bay, California. Uh, activist, author of 35 books. And uh, thank you so much, John, for your time and for welcoming me here to your home and for your good work in the world and well, all, the, so all that you shared with us today. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Hey there, quick favor. We're conducting an audience survey we would be really grateful if you could take just a few minutes and answer our survey. Please visit survey.prx.org slash no small endeavor. That's survey.prx.org slash no small endeavor. Would love it if you'd go take that survey today. Thanks. Our thanks to all the stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriot Harmon, Jason Sheasley, Ellis Osborne, and Tim Lauer. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is a production of PRX, Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studio. Oh.